Uh, Sean is uh, something of a serial cooperator, um, and he's also a co-founder of the Solid Fund, and a member of Principle Six, and many other things which I'm going to try and track down in their entirety so we can drop them in the chat and you can stalk him at your leisure. Um, so we've got 20 people in the session now. Um, and without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Sean, and I will relay any questions and comments as we go through. Thank you so much, Max. And thank you. Thank you for the 21 now of you uh, who piled into this session. Um, as, as Max said, it's it's really on the back of, uh, of a piece I wrote for Stern magazine uh, in the spring issue with the same, uh, with the same title as this. Um, and as Max has said, there was a big flurry of um, soul searching among um, advocates of employee ownership um, in the States in particular when this flagship employee owned business, Kirin Holdings, sold out. Uh, we don't know how much the worker owners sold out for. All that is uh, classified information, um, but I just used that as an opportunity to go to to uh, talk right right on the subject of this concept of different concepts of ownership in worker cooperatives. So, um, I, and I'm guessing that some of you might have read that article back in the day, and I am going to just recap on some of the content. But what I'd really like to do, because that article didn't reach it didn't reach any firm conclusions but what I'd like to do is to sort of extend some of the arguments um, and, and open them out into maybe the beginnings of a critique of the of the of the centrality of concepts of ownership and also other sort of ideological concepts that are very central to both employee-owned and worker cooperative um, discourse uh, such as decent work so to open it out into what I would say is a more obvi uh, obviously political uh, critique of this whole area of uh, worker cooperation and employee ownership that I've been involved with for 35 years and still am up to my ears in. So um, I'm going to be doing a lot of talking. Um, I'm not going to use slides. Um, I'll probably actually be talking for um, anything up to half an hour um, to give us just, just some time for open discussion. So um, I'm going to just start off by just uh, sort of recapping or rehashing some of the ideas from the article. So ownership, like democracy, is a word packed with in conflicting interpretations, but it's often used as if it has a universally shared meaning. Um, Eleanor Ostrom articulated a view of collective management of common resources as stewardship. Um, in the 70s and the 80s, um, a similar concept underpinned a wave of worker cooperative formations in the UK, um, as well as a new law, the Industrial Common Ownership Act of 1976, the stub of which actually is still exists in law and it defines a, a worker, a common ownership worker cooperative in law, even though it doesn't have any consequences. Um, and um, so co-ops like Sumer, Calverts, uh, My Co-op, Unicorn and new worker co-ops in technology and other sectors uh, are owned by their worker members in this collective sense of stewardship. Um, it describes a form of corporate possession, um, but also extends to cultural assets such as set the sense of job ownership, solidarity practice and the social mission of worker co-ops when they have one. So typically in this type of enterprise, a worker doesn't need to buy in when they join and they receive no payout when they leave. Um, so although there's no legal provision for indivisible reserves, as there is in countries with a codified legal system like France, Spain, Italy, um, on dissolution, a common ownership co-op must pass any of its residual assets to another common ownership co-op or to a sympathetic collective body. So unlike a charity or a community interest company, this asset lock, you might call it, is a voluntary in the spirit of the first cooperative principle, which is the voluntary principle. And it can be undone by a decision of a super majority of worker members. But actually, that happens extremely rarely. On the whole, uh, common ownership co-ops have an ethos of honouring the social contract between previous and present generations of worker members by passing collective ownership of the enterprise to the next generation, hopefully in better shape, not always. 
Um, by contrast, employee ownership through direct allocation of shares to individuals or the holding of shares in a trust for employee benefit leans to a different concept of ownership, uh, one that's more transactional and individualized because it implies the right of the current owner to dispose of the owned thing as they see fit and to profit from the disposal. So this is the model of New Belgium, which used an employee share ownership plan, an ESOP, a key feature of the US employee ownership system. Um, of course, as in any other actual example of ownership, the right of owners of ESOP shares to dispose at will is in fact hedged around with internal and ex external regulation. Um, but in practice, as long as the firm was a profitable going concern, the ESOP built up a supercharged and tax efficient retirement fund for its employee members. And the Kirin deal simply induced them to cash out early. Um, but the hand wringing over the loss of New Belgium is in some ways strange because it's actually just the, the latest in a string of such sales in the US and Canada. And the experience in the UK is actually similar. Uh, firms like John Lewis, the, the super tanker among the UK's small fleet of employee owned businesses, have sailed a steady partnership course for decades. But in Wales, for instance, where Wales Co-op Centre facilitated many worker buyouts through trusts and shares in the 80s and 90s, most of the converted firms ended up back in conventional private ownership within a few years. So why does this surprise us? Um, at the surface level, worker co-ops and employee ownerships have a lot in common because they give workers equity in the enterprise. Um, according to researchers, this correlates with higher levels of productivity and profitability, uh, better work conditions, greater business durability and more industrial peace. Um, so if you could walk down a high street where 40% of the firms were worker co-ops, 40% were employee owned and 20% were family businesses, what wouldn't there be to like? But on another level, they diverge quite sharply. Um, and here to generalize and perhaps overgeneralize, worker cooperatives come out of and align with the workers and social movements, um, often contest capitalism and could be said to prefigure a classless or solidarity based social system. Uh, whereas employee ownerships come out of the quest for legacy by philanthropic owners, they favor a more stable and efficient capitalism and are comfortable with the present social relations inside and outside the workplace. I mean, in reality, things are more blurred, especially if you look at outside the Anglophone countries. So, uh, you know, once again, who cares if you think workers are the only social class with both motive and latent power to overturn the present system? Well, the answer may be clear. But even in the cooperative movement, there's a strand of opinion that doesn't even re regard worker cops as legitimate um, since they only benefit workers. Um, on the other side, some advocates of share based models say that common ownership just keeps workers down by promising them endless labor in exchange for a threadbare utopian fantasy of the future. And to paraphrase, to paraphrase Norman Watson, who was behind a lot of the uh, EO conversions in Wales in the 80s and 90s, he's, he said something like, and he's a person with a foot in both camps, in the co-op camp and the, and the employee ownership camp. He, he said something like, I don't really lose sleep if the workers cash out uh, and the business goes back into private ownership because the workers got a wedge of money from the deal, which they wouldn't have done otherwise. So it looks at this way, both models of ownership hold out the prospect of jam tomorrow, um, not today for workers, but with share ownership just getting there a bit quicker. But it gets more interesting when we move from the question of ownership to that of control, both of the enterprise and in terms of its accountability to the wider social movement. So we've seen that share ownership appears to confer greater powers of disposal to the worker, and maybe it does when the question is whether to flog the business. Um, but in practice, employee owned firms often keep significant ownership in the hands of the legacy shareholders, and they almost always preserve some kind of um, golden golden share or mode of command and control with layers of professional management directing workers both at the strategic level and at the day-to-day -day level. So this can be explained by the philanthropic origins of many employee-owned businesses. Um, owners find it harder to give away the idea that they possess special know-how than they do to some or most of their shares. And in the words of Bob Moore, who's the former owner of Bob's Red Mill Natural Foods in Oregon, another large and profitable ESOP, Nothing about the new arrangement will change a thing. 
I may have given them the company, but the boss part is still mine. So in general, the idea that a financial stake in an employee-owned business in itself will spark the worker loyalty and extra productivity that gives the company its edge. But we know that in, in many ways, money isn't, isn't, is, is, is only one fact, motivating factor for workers. Um, successful worker co-ops, the very best ones, embody lifelong skills development, a culture of equality, the opportunity for workers to collectively self-manage their working lives right down to the day-to-day -day level and support for their life outside the workplace. And when they achieve this, they also increase efficiency by reducing the need for executive managers whose principal function in any firm is to maintain discipline and whose services are generally expensive. So the conclusion might be that both forms of business get an advantage by being able to retain skilled workers and build a base of expertise resulting in higher productivity, but they do this in different ways. Um, in worker co-ops, which have developed some of the most advanced applications of practical democracy anywhere, in my view, um, collective self-determination reaches well beyond the realm of corporate governance and actually into the everyday process of production. Um, employee ownerships and worker co-ops also have a very different take on information and transparency. So to work well, co-ops have to practice true open book management with almost all information available to members on the basis that if you don't have the information or, or don't know how to use it, then you, can't, then you aren't in control. Um, by contrast, information culture in many employee ownerships amounts to giving members an annual update of their financial pot, running quality circles, which is the old suggestion box with bells on, um, or implementing nudge measures to improve worker performance. Um, at the launch of the One Million Owners campaign, this is Cooperatives UK's joint initiative with the Employee Ownership Association, uh, the boss of a London PR company spoke with great pride about how her employee-owned business has become more transparent. And she said, everyone has access to all the information, except, of course, sensitive things like how much each of us earns. So none of this might matter, except that um, mistaking employee ownership for worker cooperation or conflating them could lead to wasted effort on the part of activists boosting business narratives that have no real meaning for, for, for me or us. Um, and um, the, the, the truth is, is the future of worker cooperation lies in the hands of workers for whom, wherever they are, the tools and experience of past and present worker cooperation needs to be made meaningful and available. And that's a hard task. It can't be achieved with top-down initiatives or novel legal and tax frameworks. Um, so that's a sort of, you know, th th that's a kind of kickoff point for it. And I guess that since writing that article, I've kind of been thinking more about, the, you know, does ownership matter? You know, this question of does ownership matter? Um, and, you know, I started my life in worker co-ops in the 1980s with quite a political view, or I was a political activist. And to some extent, it was kind of co-op schmo-op. Uh, I wasn't really bothered about the co-op thing, but what I did know was that when you got involved in a political enterprise, um, they tended to, they almost always were co-ops. And if they were a trading enterprise, they tended to be worker co-ops. And that was just how you did it. It was almost like a kind of um, automatic thing. And it, it wasn't until, you know, until I've been working in my, in co-ops and then started actually working with groups of people, other groups of people who, who were setting up work co-ops who were interested in the work co-op idea that I started to go back and actually sort of re reassess the value of worker cooperation and rethink it. And in recent years, I've, I've kind of returned to a more political, um, political framework or a shell of political thinking about worker co-ops and their significance. Um, and it comes out of, you know, my understanding that the, the, the daily life of the working class is political. Um, and so I want to contribute for the debate on, you know, working class emancipation and um, by reflecting on, you know, our experiences and discussing some of the lessons and, and, and you know, all this is part of it. And I appreciate that obviously the New Economy Festival is an opportunity to, to talk about this stuff and to participate and support each other in this process. Um, so some, you know, some, yeah, in my view, capital, 
because because we talk about capitalism a lot and and we don't talk we don't really analyze what capitalism is but in my view you know capital is not a thing or an alien self-contained power it's actually a social relationship um work in capitalism is is both atomized cut into small steps arranged across multiple departments and professions uh, workers are divided between intellectual workers by brain and workers by hand. Uh, we know all about how some types of work are very highly paid, some very, very low paid. Um, but on the other hand, you know, so in other words, in order to produce a certain commodity, um, actually requires the cooperation of thousands of workers across the globe so one of my you know my point would be is that actually cooperation is actually de is essential to capitalism and it happens all the time um it's not generally written into into any contract and in fact most workers wildly overperform on their contracts uh, workers cooperate both at the at the at the level of the workplace but also, you know, through global networks to create value chains, um, and we do this. You know, this is what this is what workers do. Um, but the seemingly independent power of capital lies in the fact that we, as atomized workers, can only get in touch with the wider social dimension through capital. So, although capital is a product of our work, to the individual worker, it seems like the precondition of work and capital itself seems like the source of social productivity um so you know to see social phenomena as actual practical historical relationships rather than things or entities or identities also can help us inform our discussions around questions of racism uh, patriarchy and other hierarchical uh, relationships in the working class um, so the assumption that the particular form in which work is organized in capitalism, the confrontation of the individual with a global industrial cooperative apparatus is at the heart of the power relationship between the social between the social classes. And this has massive consequences because if it's the form of work itself, that's the problem, then cooperativism uh, whatever its uh, conception of ownership can only change the form of property and possibly modify the form of local control but it doesn't change the fact that we are subjugated and exploited by workers systemically um, so we ourselves produce the conditions in which we live and yet we are dominated by those conditions and it's no by no means easy to make this deranged relation clear um, so generally, generally, when you go to work, you've agreed to sell your labor power to the boss for a certain amount of money. Uh, that boss buys the labor power in the same way that they buy electricity, raw materials, lorries. But the difference with labor power is that in setting it to work, it creates surplus value. It creates surplus. Um, in other words, it's the sum cost of the of the labor power, the raw materials, the rent, etc., is less than what the products are exchanged for, and the surplus, the surplus, the profit, uh, comes only from the work done by workers. That profit then has to immediately go out into the world and reproduce itself by the same process that it was created by, and so that surplus itself becomes capital, um, which is the power to further further. Um, engage, employ, and ultimately exploit labor. Um, but this can only happen if the right conditions are created and recreated. So capital needs the right atmosphere in which to breed. Um, so law, politics, religion, ideology, policing, uh, military force, armies, all of these things in different proportions at different times have to jump, it, jump to capital's tune in order to create the conditions for this process to continue so when people think that it's natural that when they leave the workplace they don't pick up all the things that they've made that day and take them home because they take it as granted that those things actually belong to capital whether that's socialized capital cooperative capital or privately owned capital but the capital that sat behind today's production is surplus value created from your work yesterday 
Um, and capital isn't a single great lump. It's divided into competing elements, all trying to ensure their own survival. And there's a lot of that going on right now. But even, even, even more, um, those lumps of capital are actually at war with the workers they're exploiting. And, and there are, you know, there are multiple fronts of this. So, so much of this has risen to the surface or some of this, these relationships of power have become so obvious through the, through the recent crisis. Um, but with the emergence of the factory system of production, um, capital becomes the dominant force in production, but it's forced to create and live with, with its en enemy. And its enemy is the people it exploits. Um, the socialized conditions of production created by the workplace give rise not just to workers, but to a working class um, who from the very beginning are trying to organize to get a bigger share of what they produce. Um, capital can't exist without the working class, um, but the working class is its own antithesis. So the working class, what does the working class do, has to do to end this deranged relationship? To turn what's already a socialized production form into a socially controlled production where those who create the wealth decide what society as a whole needs and how those needs will be met. Um, and they'll need to sweep away the political and straight state infrastructure that's created by capital for its own reproduction. And it will need to replace it with forms of social organization that allows for production for human need. So that's the sort of, you know, that's a, a kind of zooming out from more detailed questions of modes of ownership in employee owned and cooperative businesses to have a more political look. Because there is, you know, I do worry that there's, you know, that people do imagine that we can somehow trans, we can create a new economy or the new economy that we want, one co-op at a time, you know, one one bakery, one brewery, um, you know, one print shop, and it doesn't happen like that. Um, I think the, the what, what all this suggests to me, certainly in terms of my work and the, and the focus of where, you know, what, what I'm going to try to support is that I think that, you know, that we reach a situation of tension just through the sort of, just through the, the contradictions of the system itself. So, you know, we are, you know, we're, we're a lot closer than we were six months ago to a point where capital and its agents are running out of ideas and running out of running out of ammo for how to keep this shit show on the road and on the other side workers more generally and in a more organized way are getting pissed off with this and, and, and are um are, all, are getting organized to um to, to try and change things or to improve their conditions but for this to go beyond the kind of you know where does the where does the cooperative mode fit into this? Well, for me, worker co worker cooperatives are one form of worker cooperation, and as we've already seen, cooperation happens every day, whether it's cooperative cooperation or capitalist cooperation. But I think that that actually, rather than focusing on how worker co-ops or employee ownerships, when they work when they're working very well make capitalism go a bit more smoothly and and promote social peace i think the real value in in worker cooperatives is what they do in terms of helping individual workers and groups of workers to realize that they know everything they need to run this world we know everything we need to run this world we do not actually need capitalism at all but also to actually practice that in terms of assuming individually and collectively responsibility and power for actually organizing production, both at a strategic level and on the, on the day to day level, as well as I think worker co-ops actually are very good at developing tools and culture for challenging the divisions among us, um, for challenging the hierarchy between white collar and blue collar labor, the hierarchy between men and women, and uh, the hierarchies around education and and cultural class and actually what we need to be doing is is focusing on these um and and saying okay you know decent okay these are better jobs yeah they're better jobs but but there's no such thing as decent there's no such thing as decent work in capitalism what there is is more decent than less decent work but um you know there, there, there isn't really there isn't really a perfect job as long as we're we're in the system but what what worker cooperatives can do and how um is 
is to be able to introduce some of the tools and techniques that worker cooperatives use on an everyday level to strengthen the workers' movement more broadly. So that's that's kind of my uh, my offer. And I've been talking for only 25 minutes. Um, and at that point, I'm going to just shut up. Shut up, Sean, as they say. Um, as Max said, Max said, Sean's always got an awful lot to say. So um, there you go. Um, <laughs> And if, oh, there's 42 of you now. That's cool. Mm. Um, so I'm just going to I'm I'm just going to sort of back off for for five minutes or so and gather my thoughts and gather my breath and see where this goes. And whether people want to challenge what what I've said or um, you know challenge that perspective, or pick up any aspects of it, or if indeed go back to these more kind of detailed um, detailed considerations around ownership. Um, and and indeed control. You know what do we mean by ownership and control, really? Um, and take a breather. And thank you for listening. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Sean. Um, so yeah, as you've mentioned, we've covered quite a lot within that conversation. And as you point out, there's not really any uh opportunity to separate the issue of the detailed level within organizations from the overall political movement and the wider effort that we need to engage in um we have uh we've uh, also noted a quote from you uh there's no such thing as decent work under capitalism which uh you might steal that sean i'm just telling you now in the spirit of cooperation <laughs> um so we've had a couple of questions come in. Um, Hannah was asking, have you ever seen an employee owned business transition into a co-op? Have you got experience in that? Um, I'm sure there are examples, yes. Um, what, what I have observed is that organizations tend to carry on the way they started. It's quite actually quite rare for organizations to change one thing i have i mean one example is lembas in leeds which is uh, uh, a whole food worker co-op and that's quite an interesting example because they were um you know they're, they're not as big as suma and Trinity and etc cetera, etc cetera, but lembas were considered part of the worker co-op network of of whole food, whole food whole, wholesalers i think they have sort of 10 or 12 workers and they always operated or, you know, they, I mean, everybody knew them as a worker co-op, but it actually turned out after 25 years that they weren't actually a work, you know, they weren't formally a worker co-op, that actually they were owned by one person uh, or one person hold, held most of the shares. So they actually went through a process of trying to realign that. And, 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 you know, this is after quite a long time. And actually what they went for was an employee-owned trust option, an EOT. And that's a... You know that's a system where essentially the the um, you know the workers are paid through dividends. The golden shares are held in a trust. The trustees can't be identical with the board of directors. It's it's all quite complicated, and it looks a little bit like a charity in the sense that the, the trustee board is not allowed to be identical with the with the management board, and they're certainly not allowed to be beneficiaries. And there are people um, like uh, Norman Watson's successor andy harrison who spend all their time trying to f fucking work out how to turn an eot or a trust into a worker co-op um and what they did was they so they point you know the, the the trust board is different from the board of directors the board of directors has to be elected and democratic and in many worker co-ops the way you get around that is just by, by making all the workers directors automatically that that's that's true i think in still in unicorn which has something like 90 directors but what's interesting is, is that actually what happened at Lembas was they just went, well, what we'll do is we'll, we'll, the, you know, we'll let the trust just be the trust. We'll have a board of directors, but um, we'll make sure that the, work, that the board of directors can't really do anything. And we'll rotate the directorships every couple of years so that everybody gets to be a director. And actually what we'll do on a day to day level is we'll carry on being a workers collective that just decides what to do today and how to do stuff. Um, so this kind of legal formal shell um, and the content that it, and the culture or the real content of that shell can often be at odds. 
And there are definite blends of this kind of employee ownership mentality and a worker cooperative culture. Um, so that's not an example of a, you know, I, I guess that is, it's, it's kind of like an example of an employee ownership that kind of became more cooperative. Um, but, but I would say that in a way that that shift was already predicated on an existing culture that, that existed even before that. Um, I don't know if anybody else here has any examples of a, of, you know, an EOT or a trust or a share based employee owned business that, that where the workers went, actually, we want more control than this and we want fewer managers and we want more equal pay and we want da 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 da. But uh, it's a good question. Mm. Uh, I'll take this opportunity oh, okay. to remind everybody who's uh, in the session that if you would like to join the conversation and share your audio, you can quest share audio video and I can add you into the conversation. You'd be very welcome. Uh, in, the chat, Absolutely. Though, yeah. in the chat, there's been it some comments be about uh, Riverford, who, uh, Riverford's recent conversion to uh, worker ownership, um, which there are a number of links here, including an article written by Hazel Sheffield uh, in the FT um, uh, covering that. Do you have any knowledge of that, Sean, about Riverford's um, conversion? Not, not as much as Johnny Gordon Farley, but um, I do, you know, who, who knows everything about it. But I think, I mean, as Hazel said, um, I, I forget the name of the owner, the, the former owner of Riverford, but he still he still got this. Is refers to what I was talking about earlier, which is it's, it's actually quite rare for the philanth you know a philanthropic um, transition for the for the former owner not to keep a keep keep some kind of massive influence in the business because actually most employee ownerships, um, you know, it's only a the workers only have a minority of shares. Um, and, and the EOA, the Employee Ownership Association, has um, plenty of members where uh, workers own a, own a minority of the business. But even where they own a majority, you know, 25% or 26% shareholding sounds like 26% sounds like somewhere else it says that anything can be blocked by 25% uh, of the shareholders. So he has a veto on certain things. And that's why I say that philanthropic owners often often have a very strong belief in their own virtue, in their own skill, in their own insight, um, in their own beneficence, and, and actually would not want to trust the, trust the workers entirely uh, with the whole shebang, because, what, because the workers might go and fucking sell the thing and take the money. But my, my argument is, in the, in the article, is, or it's certainly Norman Watson's argument, is that these are workers who might be getting five or 10 or 15, or in the case of, of uh, Kieran, $100,000 that they would not have got otherwise. In other words, why shouldn't the workers get some cash sometimes, which is their criticism of the common ownership model is to say, well, you know, common ownership, common ownership workers are always poor. They're never, ever going to have a bit of money. You know? It's not entirely true. You should have a look at some of these tech co-ops because they earn fantastic money. But some of the new tech co-ops, which are common ownership, uh, they have fabulous wages. So, yeah. Hmm. Um, we've got a question from Wayne asking about the complex legal structures, uh, whether they're in place to protect the worker ownership, going back to some of the examples that you gave, I think. Um, is that the case, that the complex legal structures are put in place to safeguard the worker ownership? Yeah, very often there are. You know, the, the, I mean, and in fact... In, in employee ownerships and in worker co-ops, you could say that the legal shell is is very often focused on trying to entrench or make it extremely difficult to unravel the ownership structure. So, um, you know, the the in, in, in worker co-ops that are common ownership, in other words, they have a clause in their articles that say that this is a common ownership co-op individuals can't benefit on dissolution and it will take a hundred percent vote of all of the members to reverse that or it's entre entrenched entrenched in the, in company law um similarly in in employee ownerships you'll see you know there are there are sort of fiendishly complicated checks and balances to try and kind of model and ensure and govern how this is going to work in perpetuity or if it's changed it can only change very slowly or whatever but my, my, you know, all of which are very worthy and people spend a lot of time 
fiddling around with them and trying to get them right because it is a high level expression of the identity of the co-op but it's an incorporated entity ultimately the co-op or the firm or the you know the 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 society is a legal person that isn't actually a real person and this gives rise to a lot of problems i think because when a co-op is a voluntary association it's an unincorporated association it's a, it's just a bunch of people doing something organizing to do something together in the economic sphere they incorporate and they adopt you know they 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 reach a point where they go All right we have to get going we have to incorporate we have to get some kind of legal structure because they want that for two reasons first of all because if they want to transact or make contracts um other organizations including you know governments clients suppliers don't like dealing with 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 an organization that's a bunch of people they want to have uh, they like to have an incorporated entity in other words this person this legal person who isn't a person the other reason they do it is because because all the legal liability falls on this person who isn't a person it protects the the individual members of the co-op from from personal liability for potential loss it potential trading losses for instance as long as it's in good faith now that's fine but the problem you know that there is you know what goes on in terms of the real culture the you know a co-op is is a relationship between a between a group of people sharing a purpose and sharing some activity together is that over time people can start to think that the co-op actually is this legal person it's not actually the people well so they start talking about the co-op as if it's some some meta meta entity well it is legally but in reality it isn't and this is a, this is a, you know in fact legal incorporation is a capitalist trick designed to enable in, enable capitalism not not designed to enable workers and in some ways all these legal hacks whether it's through a trust or an ownership, you know or a or a co-op or whatever is an is a kind of is a work is is a group of workers hacking this capitalist technology for solidarity purposes but it can go wrong when you get you know but it, i mean it's you know you have you you know you have to have it in this world maybe in the world i'm talking about where if we you know where you overcome if we could overcome capitalist social relations we would certainly not need incorporated entities in oh there's another there's another com controversial line for you uh, Nathan Brown will probably have something to say about this. He's, I can see he's in the chat there, and he's a very experienced uh, worker co-op uh, developer, and I know he has views on the subject if he wants to come in on it. Sean is reminding us Sean. that worker co-ops, well, legal entities are ontologically subjective entities. I uh, may as well put my philosophy masters to some use. Um, uh, we had a brief request there from Nathan Brown to join the chat. Um, there we go. Oh, uh, yeah. Can you hear me right? Yep. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah, I, I would actually take issue with what Sean said, uh, because the society legal form isn't actually set up along the lines of the capitalist paradigm, whatever you want to call this. Um, I understand what you're saying about companies, you know, hacking the company forms that, that were created for investors and merchants to go and exploit the world and then and then be able to run away from their debts if it all went wrong. But I see society legal forms, that is cooperative societies and community benefit societies as being distinctly different. And what they actually do is they protect the members who may not have the personal wealth to be able to go and risk everything on a venture to be involved in the economy. So a bit, bit of a difference of opinion there, Sean. Fair does. I won't come back. I won't come back on it, but um, I'm sure there's lots of, other, lots of other things people want to chip in. Cool. I was just wondering, from your experience of having worked with numerous uh, employee-owned worker cooperative and uh, community-owned uh, organisations, is there any examples from your experience that have cropped up for you while you've been listening to the chat? Uh, I mean, what is it you really want? Um, have you got any experience of some of the challenges that come up with um, uh, some of these issues of employee ownership, um, the running of worker co-ops, these kind of things that we've been discussing? I mean, it, in my experience, it's normally been a case of the, the workers 
choose they want to be a co-op and that is the form they take you know and sometimes there's a lot of hard work in convincing the owner um and quite often it'll fail um generally if if there's an employee ownership route chosen it's quite often taken because that's a tax efficient way for the owner as well as a tax efficient way for for the workers to get their money out of the business so um but in general i've shied away from employee ownership structures i mean ha having sort of sat in on a half day session with with a lawyer david dawes who's done an awful lot of them i decided i didn't need to know that level of complexity and actually on a political level like sean i, I would rather just go down the straightforward co-op route and there are plenty of practitioners out there or, or practitioners enough who will do the employee ownership and, and I'll, if they want to do that i just step away because I find it muddies the water too much, but that might be me being overly simplistic and perhaps missing an opportunity. Yeah, I had a, you know, I had a, I had an experience. I, like Nathan, I decided I need to understand this employee ownership thing more. And I actually had a referral from a business, a successful architectural reclamation business in Shoreditch in London, where the owner, uh, with about 10 employees, very profitable, um, where the, 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 the owner was dying and he didn't have any relatives and he wanted to give the business to his employees. His employees being, you know, um, a posh bloke and a posh bird um, doing all the front front sales stuff, you know, taking all this. And then kind of seven Polish guys in the warehouse organizing everything and chipping everything and cleaning it up and so forth. Um, and and because he seemed to want an employee ownership route and it was a succession thing, I gave it to actually um, uh, Andy Harrison, who I've mentioned before, and Norman Watson. And I said, the cost of me giving you this referral is that, is that I come along as an apprentice and learn how you do it. Um, and I actually got chucked out of the second meeting by the business owner because he thought I was a red. Um, because he asked, he actually said to us, he said, so you three, are you are you are you, are you socialists? And, um, and and Norma Watson said, "Look, I have an extremely strong set of principles, and if you don't like them, I've got another set of in the boot of my car that you might prefer." Whereas I said, "Well, I'm not. I'm I'm more of a communist than a socialist." And at that point, he just threw me out. Um, but I revisited the I revisited that after that succession was done and it took about a year the whole business went over to the workers without any problems um because there was you know the, in that case the beneficial owner wasn't around to want his payout because he actually signed the papers on his deathbed um but norman told me that at the wake for the owner that they had after all the, the transfer had gone through they had a big piss up and the, and the sort of foreman of the polish guys came up to him at the end of the night and said so that's it. Do we get our redundancy notices in the morning? In other words, they didn't even know that they owned the business. They had, you know. Now I think I, I think talking to Andy afterwards, that's a bit of a spin, and you know whatever. But what, what I'm saying is that the focus was entirely on the, the the mechanism of transfer and tax matters, and not at all on building any kind of cooperative culture or sense. You know. Uh, giving the workers any tools to actually run the business um but there you go i think i'd like to pick up on some of the issues of succession that have been mentioned but before we get onto that um there's a question that's been sitting there from wayne asking uh, quite practically um what would be the typical exit of for an employee after maybe they've been employed for 10 years how what would that look like within our worker co-op or within an employee-owned organization? Um, well, again, uh, Nathan can probably back me up on this, but in general, in general, if ownership is through shares, which it usually is, then the then the employee can sell their shares back to the back to the trust. And the um, and, but those shares have to stay within the trust or be or be redistributed. Um, so the thing is, I mean, and in fact, a lot of, you know, certainly in the, in the 10 years ago, you could say that employee ownership, employee trust, employee share schemes were actually a tax dodge because what was going on was that essentially that you'd have this complicated thing with workers, workers being allocated shares, those shares being worth a certain amount of money, those shares going up in value. 
the workers then selling those shares back to the trust for the for the value then the trust issues new shares and re and allocates more shares to that worker at a different price all of which avoids avoids income tax and and avoids a lot and avoided a lot of stuff in terms of capital gains and all the rest of it i mean it's a total scam the the point about it is so there are mechanisms there are definitely mechanisms to allow people to withdraw their to withdraw their um their capital workers to withdraw their capital from the business but it all depends on the business being perpetually profitable and very profitable. That's how it all works. As long as the business is profitable, it works. When 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 employee ownerships cease to generate profits, they unravel really quickly. And there are, there are examples like um, Tullis Russell Papermakers in Scotland. Uh, you know, six hundred, very very good firm, but you know they hit a global. A, gro a global problematic and it actually destroyed the destroy you know, the whole thing just fell apart and destroyed a really good firm what you do find in worker co-ops is that they're really bloody good at weathering storms um as we'll i think we'll we'll see at the end of this crisis i mean but um because they don't you know they don't carry heavy overheads in terms of in terms of management costs basically and they can really be agile on a solidarity basis I'm, I'm not. I don't like it when people go. Worker cops fantastic because they t they can all take a wage cut when uh, things go wrong. But the truth is uh, is that um, you know worker cooperators can be a bit a bit a bit cleverer about stuff, and they can duck and dive faster than than hierarchical firms that tend to be a bit more lumbering and and um, kind of dirigiste in terms of the way they do things. And was that papermaker example uh, employee owned or a worker co-op? It was employee owned. Mm. Um, it's a guy called David Erdl who's written who's written quite an interesting book about employee ownership. But David Erdl was, um, you know, he was a um, you know, he's a fairly typical story in some ways. He was, you know, the scion of the family that the owned Tullis Russell. Um, he got into Maoism when he was a student. He went to China and spent tons of years, got disillusioned, um, came back, but still had his, you know, still had some politics and wanted to, you know, he needed to do something with this firm he now owned and was expected to to run. And he went through this process over year, over years because because in a lot, you know, you can't it's very you can't it's extremely unusual to be able to just transfer a firm like that overnight into employee ownership. It has to be done slowly. It has to, and it has to be done by generating profits, to you know profits which are then used to buy out the existing owners and then issue new shares to the to the to the employees. So I think with Tullis Russell, it took something like ten years to get it fully into employee ownership, and then another ten years before it went bust. I think earlier you made a nice distinction uh, between employee ownership effectively smoothing out some of the issues of capitalism, whereas worker co-ops allow the realisation for the workers of the power that they hold and the, the knowledge that they hold and their abilities within that. I'm wondering whether yeah. you think that employee ownership as a model can be a stepping stone towards that necessary further politicisation, or whether it can, in many cases, actually serve to obscure that potential by being potentially a bit of a tokenistic right. gesture. Yeah, well, I think this is where it comes back to the political, you know, wh where you have to look at this politically. Um, so I think that, you know, I've got, I haven't really got a problem, I haven't got a problem with firms being employee owned as long as people are kind of happy with it and get some decent money out of it. But they're not going to, it's not going to be, it's not politically interesting, I don't think, to the new economy movement if it doesn't also uh, give give workers tools and um, to to change the, the mode of work itself. In other words, give them, some, give them a, high, a much higher level of control and autonomy, both at the group level and on the individual level, over the process of work and over the relationships between workers, both within that workplace and outside the workplace. That, 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 and that's typically what worker cops do. I mean, having said on the other hand that worker cops typically come out of the social movement, the truth is that most worker co-ops, you know, most worker co-ops are not are not fantastic. They're not politically interesting. Um, but even though a lot of worker co-ops have members who are very political and they want to use their cooperative to serve 
whatever social cause they want to do, want, want to serve. It actually, um, you know, many of those, many of those, you know, what I would call the new social movements are themselves interested in conserving, conserving something rather than revolutionizing something. So this, this is where it gets controversial politically, because I would say that, you know, for instance, if you look at green and ecological uh, causes and, you know, I mean, a lot of worker cults kind of are green, are, are environmentalist or, you know, they're workerist or they're, or they're feminist. But what they're, what, they, what they're interested in doing using their worker cooperative tools is, is revealing power and then having a negotiation with that power to slightly improve things. Mm -hmm. So you could say in some ways it's not that different from possibly what employee ownerships do. Mm -hmm. And and what I'm really saying is that it's that the, the, you know worker neither work, worker cults are not revolutionary in themselves. They only become revolutionary when they become part of a wider um, social working class effort to uh, to overcome the system and, and institute something different. But when they come to that battle, worker cults can bring some tools and experience of of how on a on a kind of day to day level you do this and how you. Um, how you you know how how they can help workers more broadly raise their game? Mm -hmm. uh, Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Uh, having listened to uh, everything that you're saying, um, something's been occurring to me, and you can let me know whether I'm correct in this. Um, worker co-ops, of course, can be more efficient because they, uh, aside from other things, they demonstrate that a lot of management isn't actually necessary. So you can remove a whole layer of middle management and. Uh, unnecessary bureaucracy within the operation of uh, an enterprise. Of course, if it's uh, a company yeah. which is transitioning to employee ownership, uh, then that's still going to employ the, uh, it's still going to include the employees who will be occupying those positions. So you don't necessarily have the same opportunity to increase the efficiency or change the way of working uh, that a worker co-op would. Would you say that's, that's accurate? There's um, more bullshit, more capacity yeah. for bullshit jobs in employee ownership? Um, yeah, maybe. I mean, I would say that probably ideologically, people who are initiating employee ownerships um, tend to believe that professional management is is always necessary. You know, I, I, I mean, I mean, professional management not as a process, but as a cadre of people who are held to know more than other people, um, and who therefore need to be paid more and also given more power. But I think this is, you know, I think these questions are quite interesting. You know, when you look at the UK and the US, it, this seems to be the way it goes. If you look at Italy or you look at France, France is interesting. They don't have this division between employee ownerships and worker co-ops. It's, it's kind of mixed up. So in, in France, they've got a very sophisticated and well well organized methodology for turning firms into what they call worker co-ops, so, so, uh, SCOPs, Société Coopérative des Producteurs. Um, and it will be very often a firm that's actually, you know, where the where the owner wants to piss off, or it's, you know, it's not doing very well for some reason. Well, the owner wants to close the gates. And in France, they have a legal uh, right of request from workers, or a first right to to actually take over a company in that situation. But they have to move fast. They probably have to move and do it, do the whole deal in three months. Um, they have a, you know, they have a. a a system of local and national advisors. Uh, the trade unions are usually involved in it, um, and they have a they have a, a, a financial a financial mechanism for settling any any external debts, buying any buying out any machinery, etc. That's needed. But quite often, what happens there is is that the firm reopens, and and whoever was the trade union convener in the factory becomes the general manager, almost kind of automatically, and everything kind of carries on. Um, and uh, nobody makes a big fuss about commons or shares or anything. So there's there's something peculiarly peculiarly Anglo about this whole problematic that we seem to have this this kind of dichotomy. Um, and it's different. It's very different in other countries, other European countries, certainly in the, let alone Argentina or Japan. But so we're coming towards the end of the session. We've got uh, just under four minutes left. Wayne has just dropped another question in the chat. Thank you. Um, so, are worker courts mostly going to be organic, feminist, green, community and so on? Uh, are they going to be organised on that basis? Or is it possible to have maybe a small 
micro framework to give to those guys uh, readily available to help them build something. Uh, Wayne, you can let me know whether I've correctly paraphrased what you're asking there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that um, when you look at some of the sort of advanced tools that worker cops are using now um, for certainly sort of the way they 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 discuss and decide things internally, um, sort of dynamic governance, sociocracy, a lot of those tools are really explicitly aimed at equalizing voice, for instance, um, you know, absolutely ma not making sure that people don't just have the opportunity to speak, but they do speak and, and making sure that they are heard. So, so sort of equalizing. So if you, for instance, if you're looking at, if you're looking at equalizing men and women, women men and women's voice in a co-op, a lot of the, there are a lot of off the, you know, kind of off the shelf techniques and technologies that worker cults are using for that. But um, I mean, a, a lot of their, you know, and, and it's probably also true, I would say, that where you have a really strong culture of equality and, and justice inside a co-op, in terms of its internal relationships, they will, what will tend to happen is that they'll tend to want to express that externally in terms of their relationships, their broader relationships in the society, whether it's, you know, in their local area or in their supply chain. So they'll, you know, they would naturally be looking to work with or develop um, relationships outside the co-op that are supportive of um, of local working class development or that can serve, um, you know, that have ecological aims. In other words, they won't want to pour fucking poisonous chemicals down the sink. That's certainly true. My co-op Calvert's wasn't a green co-op; it was a workerist co-op, and it is now the it is now the most advanced um ecological printing business in london in my view and that didn't happen because people were greens it happened be, it, it was a sort of almost like a natural a natural progression from how we wanted to relate to each other as a group of workers and then that chart that also had market payoffs as well there's no doubt about it um so if that actually makes any sense i mean i wouldn't say you know, I mean, the community relationship is interesting because one thing I haven't touched on, I know it's 1659, is that I hope to never use the word community ever again when I talk about co-ops because I think it's a, it's an ideologically mystifying concept. Um, however, um, you know, sometimes worker co-ops, there are tools like the worker community hybrid model that enable what are essentially worker co-ops to give... Um, to give governance voice and to give real voice to uh, people other than the worker members. Uh, Kitty's Laundrette in Liverpool is a really good example, for instance. Um, so, and, and, and actually, ultimately, of course, the relevance of worker cooperatives isn't, isn't actually anything to do with what goes on inside one or more individual worker cooperatives. It's to do with it precisely uh, it, the the technology of worker cooperation um, interpreted and implemented more widely at the social level and that's where we that's where we can start talking to talk, start talking about a new economy realistically because i don't think we can talk about a new economy one co-op at a time amazing stop that um well thank you so much sean um i have dropped a selection of links into the chat there um you've got links to sean on twitter to Calverts, to Solid Fund, and to various other organizations that Sean is associated with. Uh, we could continue this conversation, of course. There's so much to touch upon. Uh, if you scroll back up in the chat, you will be able to find a link to Sean's article, um, which was written prior to the thoughts that he's been sharing in this chat. But if you would like to find that and have a read through about the kind of issues that he's been discussing, that is freely available for you to access and download. Um, but aside from that, I will uh, just thank you, Sean. And uh, thank I'll you. remind people that if you want to get in touch with Sean, you can DM him in um, the system on here. Uh, I haven't asked Sean if he's willing to receive that torrent of messages, but I've... I am, I am, and I have heard of that. I've actually put my email address in the in the chat if anybody wants to follow up on any of this on any level. I'd be very happy. Fantastic. Um, brilliant. Okay, well, we will leave it there. Um, please continue the conversation. Sean is um, 
a pivotal figure in the UK co-op movement, in my opinion. And it's great to have you with us. Thanks a lot, Sean. Thank you. Cheers. Take care.